and gentlemen, it's 7 o'clock, and as mayor, I call to order the meeting of Laconia City Council scheduled for this hour on Monday, May 8, 2017. As always, we'll begin our meeting with a salute to the American flag. I would ask that you please rise and join Councilor Armin Bullock in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. I will note for the record that our, the minutes to tonight's meeting are being kept by City Clerk Mary Reynolds. I would ask that she please call the roll. Here. Councilor Brown. Here. Councilor Mayor. Present. Councilor Present. Councilor Here. Present. Also note for the record that the council is joined at the front table tonight by City Manager Scott Myers and by the Finance Director Donna Woodeman. First order of regular business tonight is acceptance of minutes. These are the minutes to our last meeting on April 24th. They were submitted to the, to the council membership on August 26th by the clerk. No corrections or changes were received by the clerk. And so offering the council one mass chance to make any changes in lieu of that, uh, I will declare that the minutes to our April 24th meeting are approved as submitted by the clerk. Consent and action calendar. We have two items on the agenda tonight. <clears throat> One is a request by the American Cancer Society to raise funds at Opeachy Park on October 18 through October 22nd for the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, an annual event that we've approved many times. Any questions before we get to motions? <coughs> All right, a motion be in order to approve the request by the American Cancer Society to raise funds at Opeachy Park on October 18 through October 22, 2017 for the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer walk as requested. Moved by Councilor Boldick, seconded by Councilor Doyle. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving that request, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative. And uh, that motion carries. I failed to note earlier that um, we have one councilor absent tonight, Councilor Lippman, but five are present and that a quorum has been established for this meeting. Sorry for overlooking that. Next uh, request is to approve the Winnipesaukee Flagship Corporation site plan for 211 Lakeside Avenue railroad station vendor layout for Motorcycle Week 2017. Apparently the flagship corporation missed the deadline for submitting their plan this year, but there are no changes to what it's always been as far as I know. And so a motion would be in order to approve the site plan submitted by the Winnipesaukee Flagship Corporation for 211 Lakeside Avenue railroad station vendor layout for Motorcycle Week 2017. Moved by Councilor Boldick, seconded by Councilor Doyle. Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. Have they paid all fees uh, for the technical re review committee and all that? Uh, they will pay the, the associated vendor license fees and everything that are appropriate with their site, yes. Okay. Whether, whether they have to date or not, I'm not sure, but they will before the event starts. Okay. <coughs> all those in favor, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative. That request is approved as well. Citizen comments for matters not on tonight's agenda. This is the appropriate place in the evening for anyone to address the City Council uh, who wishes to on a matter that is not on tonight's agenda. Mr. Dunn. Yes, good evening. I'm Cal Dunn. I live, at, uh, I, I live in the presidential section of Laconia on Garfield Street right by Grant and Lincoln and uh, I'm here tonight <clears throat> I have some good news well, I think I got to the bottom of the rubbish ordeal here and uh, first off I'd like to state I, I've spoken to a couple of the board members on the side and I think that 
I gather they feel a little pressured sometimes to do something and I've never asked for anything to be done so I, I'd like to put everybody at ease there I don't intend to ask for anything tonight I think one thing the paper got right was that uh, I just demanded questions wanted to know why the trash wasn't being picked up what to do about it I didn't want to mess we're not irresponsible like Union Avenue with the box spring and mattresses that are out there for a week or two wanted to make sure that everything was appropriate whatever action we took so um, at this time I, I'd like to pass out if Mary would um, this is a email that I received from Mr. Myers April 27th that indicates the city's ordinance and in in regards to the trash pickup and, and their policy in the city. And as it states here, it clearly states that, you know, they're not to pick up trash on private roadways, lanes, or anything of the such. So it's, I guess, the case the city is won. I don't get my trash picked up. They beat me. But it's not all in what will you take me. I can deal with anything you throw at me. It's how we get to you that bothered me a little bit. And I'd just like to state, you know, voice my opinion as a multiple taxpayer in the city of Laconia, outside of the Garfield Street end, multiple elsewhere in Laconia. But uh, a few things were a little disheartening. And number one, not to have notice after 40 years of service. I don't think that's good manageable services by the city. There should be some type of notice and what to do with the trash, which there was nothing whatsoever. It, it, typical with the city's um, past. I think we all agree that that was a, a, a bad oversight. Yes, and, and in fact, and Mr. Myers had apologized, but I must admit, with all sincerity, his words mean nothing to me. They're very inexpensive. So, uh, the notice, and like I said, we just wanted to find out what to do with the trash appropriately. We had no idea after 40 years what to do with it, uh, bring it to the dump or dump it in the lake or what you wanted us to do with it. So, um, that was one thing. The other thing was, moving on here, that uh, Mr. Meyer's theory, I'd like to remind the board of last session, the 24th, you know, it was that the uh, city had set an end of maintenance sign out at the end of Garfield Street, which prompted the driver of Casella's truck to take notice and to inquire about the status of the road. And Costello, uh, Costello elected to stop going up the hill. That was what we were told. Well, there's two things that Mr. Myers didn't realize like to point out. Number one, the sign that the city put out there January 25th, I have everything documented and logged, everything that's happening here. That sign was gone a week later, by the by the 1st of February. I don't know, I, I think Mr. Anderson said it got plowed up, they found it in the spring. I have no idea, I was out of state. But it was gone. So, we have a truck driver that saw a sign in the middle of March that wasn't there. I, I don't know. And, and then you may have noticed in the paper, I have two posted signs up my roadway. Uh, I think Mr. Mayor was present. If you recall, you may have seen those. And it, it just behooves me that this truck driver for 10 years never saw those posted signs. So I, I thought it was a little suspicious. The last meeting I told you I would call Casella, which I did, <clears throat> talked to the office manager, Josh Gaucher, and he fanatically denied any involvement with the termination of the trash pickup. Said it was clearly ordered by the city. And in fact, by Ann Salmash, through of course the director, uh, Wes Anderson. So it was a city all along that knew this, 
And I sat here, excuse me, stood here, April 10th, inquiring in front of the board here, trying to find out what was going on. April 24th, the same. And this man was right here. Never, he's the one that took the initiation and, and stopped, terminated the service. Never stood up and cared to explain. On April 10th meeting, Mr. Myers said he knew nothing about it. It was okay. He was going to look into it and get back to us. Two weeks. Two, two trips to the truck didn't come up. We're wondering what's going on. I, that's inappropriate, in my opinion, for a city manager. As a businessman for 43 years in this city, I didn't work that way. So, you know, there was, unfortunately, one of the councils, the last uh, meeting, isn't here tonight, and felt I was a little abrasive with my comments with Mr. Myers and Mr. Anderson. I don't take lightly the liars and deceitful people. If that's the way you want to win, that's fine. I don't play that way. The other thing that I pointed out the same subdivision that I'm in, the exact same one that was done in 1970, my brother's place, the trash is still picked up there. Mr. Mayor, you're, you're familiar with that right away, the private road that goes down there. That's selective enforcement. You understand? That's against the law, the Hampshire law. Selective enforcement. When I approached Mr. Anderson about that, he says, if you keep that up, he'll be terminated too. Why shouldn't he? Why shouldn't my brother's service be terminated if that's the law? Listen, I was born like many of you here. I love this city. I was raised here. I'll die here. Well, I don't know about that, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure they'll bury me here. Depends on the time of year. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm sure I'll be buried here. And I feel deeply about this community, and I just do not feel that I, I'm not trying to get at anybody individually. It's not a proper way and good management for the taxpayer. The custom, oh, no, we're not customers. Uh, you just take our property if we don't pay and somebody else comes along. It, well, the customers are long gone with that. But uh, at any rate, lastly, I, I was asked, what's the big deal bringing your gra trash down 300 feet? Well, the, you know, there isn't. I mean, it's not a big deal. I'm not that old. My wife and I are only here three quarters of the year. The other fourth of the year, the city does nothing. Doesn't pick up our trash, nobody occupies the house. Well, in 1973, I volunteered to run through the jungle in Southeast Asia, Vietnam. I'm a little bit older, but I can bring out the trash. I can still bring it out. But my neighbor, a middle-aged woman. Mayor, Mayor, I think he's had his five minutes. Oh, I, I'm coming to a close. If I could ask for another minute. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I apologize if this offends you, Mr. You've offended everybody. You don't need to call our city manager a liar and whatever you did. Oh, yeah? That's right. I spoke to Josh oh, let's, Rocher. Let's wrap it up here. Okay. Wrap he said the C. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. Wrap it up. It's, you're disrespectful, too. Uh, you were the one that started. All right, come on. For, Both for are. more than one meeting now. The, uh, <coughs> the neighbor, which is, I, I've admitted, a uh, tenant of mine, a middle-aged woman, she was out of work by the doctor's orders. She, worked, she was a specialist at New, New Hampshire Ball Baron. Her heart is very bad. Very, very bad. 20% of her heart. She's currently on a list to get a heart transplant. I tell you this because if she, she's found at the bottom of the hill rolled up someday, bringing down the trash, the city's going to be in a bad place. So, I, uh, I, I'd like to make one other point, again with the city manager here. 
you know, when I pointed out my situation, South Bay, Long Bay, and Briarcrest was pointed out for examples. Come on. Those are modern developments. They, they have HOA fees. They're deed restricted. This house was built in 1915. The other one in 1957. I have no deed restrictions. This has been going on. To use that for an example, um, the manager, you might as well say the city doesn't pick up trash in Belmont. So I accept the fact we'll uh, take care of the trash and uh, I'll open it to any questions or comments. I think we're all set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, one thing. If you look at the paper I, I, I gave you, the ordinance, and the bold print, you might notice F. It says ordinances refer to this code city adopted in 1995. That's 18 years after my services began. I think we're grandfathered. I mean, certainly the 1915 house, 102 years, this surpasses the, 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 the code. Ordinances cannot control the past. You only have control from the future on. 1995, that's why trash isn't picked up at Mr. Baldick's place and others. All right, we'll look into that aspect of it. Well, I'd like the board to make a decision on it tonight. Thought you weren't asking us to do anything tonight. Isn't that what you started with? All right. Well, let me phrase it this way. Why don't you do the respectable thing? I'm trying. Okay. The ordinance is Thank you, Mr. Dunn. All right. Well, we're Thank you. Thank you. All right. Could we, uh, could we ask the manager to brief us at our next meeting on, on the grandfathering issue? There's no I'd be happy to do it right now. There's no grandfathering on an item like this, on a zoning, on a setback, on uses. Those would be grandfathered, but a service like this, there's no grandfathering in state law. So uh, you lost me there on zoning and your reference to zoning and whatnot. If, if, uh, I mean, clearly there is on zoning. Right, but if something doesn't comply with the current zoning and the structure on a property, we wouldn't go in and make a property owner conform to today's zoning. The, the structure would be grandfathered. Without paying for it. There's, there's no grandfathering for something like for a service. trash or for service, like a trash pickup. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the council tonight on a matter that is not on tonight's agenda? Nope. Okay, we'll move on then to uh, public hearing. We do have a public hearing tonight. <coughs> this hearing is with regard to Ordinance 2017-235-04, amending Chapter 235, the City Code Zoning, relative to accessory dwelling units. Notice of this public hearing was made in the Thursday, April 27, 2017 edition of the Laconia Daily Sun. It was also posted at City Hall, at the Gale Memorial Library, the Laconia Community Center, and the offices of the Laconia School District. This is the new ordinance proposal to come in line with state law with regard to cities and towns losing per legislation that was passed last year in Concord uh, that prohibits towns from prohibiting as a matter of right or prohibiting I shouldn't say that accessory dwelling units in any residential area of their city and so I'm going to declare this uh, public hearing open to the public at 18 minutes past 7 and ask if there's anyone here tonight who would like to address the council on this proposal. Yes, in the back, sir. May I approach? You may, right here. And Thank you. Please help the clerk tonight, uh, any of all of you, by identifying yourself and where you live. I'm Tom Kudzma, K-U-D-Z-M-A. Six Bell Hill Drive. I think that 
I'm going to start by saying that I think the legislature bit off more than it should have in passing the state one. But that's been done. <coughs> so the question is, how does Laconia live with it? I'd like to describe a situation with which I am intimately familiar. There was a house built by a real estate agent. His parents were very elderly, and he legally put an addition onto the house, which would, by the way, comply with the requirements here. Soon his parents both died, and he rented the in-law apartment to another couple. Then he decided that he didn't want to live there, and he sold the entire kit and caboodle to another, another couple. So at that stage, we had renters and a new owner. The new owner then sold the property to my family, by the way, and they were stuck with the renter. The renter finally moved out. And my family took over the entire place as a single unit. Incidentally, the door between the so-called accessory unit and the main unit was blocked by a wall. Temporary wall was put across for privacy for the apartment. It hadn't been blocked while the original <coughs> owner's parents were in it. Now, let's take a look at what the city does, not this city. They regard this, this house as a two-family house. It's no longer an in-law apartment. It's a separate dwelling unit to the main house. Fully attached, separate heating, separate electrical, separate sewage, and so forth, meeting all the requirements for an accessory use. So we have now, upon my mother's death, we sold the house. In came the new owner, and the accessory apartment blocked off again, was used by a relative who moved out. Now it's back to two families, unrelated. You see what happens here. Back and forth, people don't live forever. And what they're doing does not go on forever. I, not as a matter of bragging, but as an information, I was on the zoning board for 22 years. I would like to think that it was a very honest board, and I'm not casting any aspersions on others. I just, I'm just stating a fact that I could always rely on the people to make an honest decision. The most painful decisions to be made were on in-law apartments. They didn't always get them. Again, they were a special exception. Does the neighborhood have similar things around? Most of you know the zoning background to that, what they have to go through. Legally, I mean. So why are they so painful? Because the person seeking the in-law apartment, let's call it what it was, usually turned out to be a developer who merely wanted to convert the accessory use to a two-family dwelling. 
not to put it in what was rated as a two-family district, but to put it, to have this thing staying alone in it. And that led to all kinds of things, such as a house across the street being renovated into, it was a single family residence. It acquired an in-law apartment and an office. And now it is a primary residence, an in-law apartment, which is separately rented, and the office is also separately rented. So it went from one to three in a single family district. I've gone through this ordinance and uh, I understand the difficulties the city is going through because I've been there. If you're going to have a separate person living there as a renter and not related in any way, the, asse the uh, uh, assessment should be for a two-family home. And that's not clearly spelled out here. It's one thing when the in-laws or the, or the uh, parents live in it and it's really one family compound, but when it separates it becomes two families. The interior door, when it becomes two families, is hardly desirable. And uh, that was seen in ours where the uh, temporary wall was put up. The additional entrance to get into it was the building was on a slope so that it was ridiculous to have the main entrance at the lower level and have to climb up the stairs into the unit, which was at ground level in the front. <coughs> Fortunately, they put a door in the front. And if you're going to have an in-law apartment or accessory for elderly people, I would assure you that my mother, when she lived in that section of the house because she was severely handicapped, use that exit and entrance for ambulance runs and fire department rescues and so forth dozens of times. They couldn't have hauled her out through any other entrance. So I think that number seven is not called for in most cases. Uh, and number 10. Is number 10 is really the front door uh, which should be there. The additional parking. There are houses in the city and nice districts where the additional car for the additional unit is parked right in the front lawn. In the front lawn. Not on it. In it. Because it's up to the hubcaps and mud not a very good thing for property values. I think the city has done its very best to, with the ordinance, it's a tough nut to crack, but I ask that my comments be uh, considered as means of improving what's here based upon my own experience. Incidentally, uh, when my parents died, they had been living in the accessory unit with complete connection. Uh, for handicapped people and very elderly people to have them on the same floor and let the ambulance be able to carry them in and out is a total blessing for them. And uh, it was only until we sold the place that we realized that we'd been taxed as a two-family all those years. By the way, the lot size and everything, there were no problems with that. I'm willing to answer any questions you might have. I've done the best I can on As I read the ordinance, the, the proposed ordinance, the, the 
assuming one meets the all of the provisions of which you outlined some, it shall not be taxed as a two-family dwelling. It shall be considered a single-family dwelling by this ordinance. But of course, I've just described the situation where it is basically used as a two-family dwelling. And, and there's nothing in this ordinance to prevent that. Correct? Correct. So I, I believe it should be in a other words, the state law does not the, the state law does not allow us to to dictate that the the, that one of the two parties, if you will, has to be, or that they have to be related. Granted, but if there are two dwelling units in the same building, it's a two-family. That's the point. Well, this is saying specifically it's not. It shall be considered a single-family dwelling with an accessory dwelling use. Granted, but I've just described a concatenation of events yeah, and if, I, if I followed you there correctly and I'm not positive that I did every different generation that you described would be perfectly legal under this ordinance except that that door could not have been closed off this says the door has to be there and that you have to have you can't have another door from the front you have to have it in the back. side or rear so yeah. there's there's there are two things okay and uh, I've just shown you the can of worms where by a two-family house would then be taxed as a single. Is that fair to those people who own rental property in the city and have a two-family house? I think there's some in injustice here that should be taken care of. Okay. You can bet your boots that when you sell the place, they're going to sell it as a two-family. <coughs> because that's what the city claims it is. Whether it's taxed as such or not is another matter. Okay. You get a minefield here. I'm just saying, send the mine, <laughs> send them out and deny. take a look. I, 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 I think that it should be amended in some way and that the delegation in Concord should also do something to it. Should the, okay. Should the zoning board have its input? My answer is yes, because otherwise we have no checks and balances, whatever. Uh, someone says, well, that's a pain. Well, it doesn't go to the zoning board for a variance or a special exception unless the zoning administrator feels that it doesn't meet the requirements of the law. Well, no, under this case, it would go regardless. Yeah, well. You have the accessory unit without the approval of the zoning board. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bogert. Hi, good evening. Stephen Bogert. I'm a resident, 21 Spruce Street. And uh, I, too, have a couple of concerns with this. As not with the sections that are regarding state law, the state law is pretty clear that anything attached is fine, dandy, and there's nothing you can much do about it. But the state law did allow the cities to come in and overview unattached buildings, okay? And under Section 4, we, the, under the way this is written, it's saying that anything that's existing would currently be okay to make an accessory to. Now, one of the things I have an issue is there's no one in a residential area. You're now taking a single family home, and if they have a 700 square foot barn, they would be able to now make that into a 700 square foot apartment. Okay. Well, where are you reading that? In section four. The one that starts the ADU? Yes. It's the last couple of lines there. And it clearly states that if it's an existing building, may it be a shed or a barn they could develop it into an accessory use 
without going to see anybody other than so you're the saying that the the square footage requirement doesn't apply if it's a separate detached unit oh it applies you can build up to 700 square foot but it can't be less than 300 square feet right so you can create in in these new times what's called a tiny home on your property by just going to the planning department and getting a building permit okay so now you're taking a single family home and building a second 700 square foot home in the backyard And the only reason I bring that up is to bring that light because there's no one overseeing that. The question came back on the zoning board as, you know, I'm on the well, zoning board. Well, you still board. have to go to the zoning board for a special exception. The, I don't see any special exception in here at all. Well, the special exception applies to all of these conditions. Does it? Yeah. But the, uh, if they uses. meet the conditions, then all you're having to do is it's an accessory use. I'm sorry, say again? If they meet the conditions written here, there's nothing other than, well, I guess there is. Okay. It's only a lot. And these accessory un, under the proposal in front of us, regardless of what zone it's in, you have to go to the zoning board to get a special exception to create an accessory dwelling unit regardless of, of, of whether it's in the garage or in the house or whatever. In every instance, you have to go to the zoning board for a special exception. Okay. Then that does create the checks and balance. I was not <coughs> aware of that portion of it. Okay. No problem. That's what the hearing's for. So. <laughs> the other thing I would add to it was... The question also was if they don't have an existing use, okay, then I, I had asked, is there, what if they build a shed or a barn? Can, do that. can they just automatically apply and then make that? Well, the question was they would have to do a two stepper, apply, build the shed or barn, and then apply. So, if there's no time frame in the difference, then theoretically, so unless somebody I'm builds, missing a, builds a barn new, builds a brand new barn, 700 square foot, and then within, as soon as they got the okay that's done, they can apply for the accessory use. Unless there's a time frame put in there to say one must have it as a barn or something like that. Uh -huh. The way I read this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you could build a brand new house and a brand new garage under this and have the above the barn have an accessory dwelling unit from day one if you get a special exception. And as long as it meets the setbacks for the yeah. side. Mm -hmm. and the, yeah, you have and to have that. enough land and for setbacks and all that. But if you do, it could be brand new. And you and you know to you get your occupancy, to, you wouldn't have to go to the step and say, oh, "I'll build it as a barn." Wait, yeah, wait, no. nod, nod, and all be done six months later, you you could get that approval right out of the gate as long as you have the setbacks and the land for it. Right, could be a brand new structure, day one. Okay, just bringing that. I'm up defending it. I'm just saying nope, that's I'm the just, way I well, read Well, that's this. why I'm bringing this up myself is to make sure everybody's aware now, of everything. the state law, as I does not, this is something we added, right? The state law does not require this that's accommodation for a detached building. That's correct. They leave that up to the discretion of the cities. I don't think so. Okay. And uh, the only thing with keeping this as an special exception and stuff and keeping it in someone else's hands is for review purposes because this could have, uh, as the gentleman spoke before, one of the things that we try to look at is not just what the present owner is doing, but the what the next person, as I call it, what is the next owner of the property going to do with it? and. So that's one of the things we try to bring up to protect the neighborhoods and stuff like that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes.
My name is Judy McGrath. I'm a resident at 195 Shore Drive in Laconia. And I'm here tonight to ask the City Council if they would consider adopting um, the ordinance that with respect to the accessory dwelling units that they make it a requirement that it would be owner occupied for one of the two units. Um, I have first-hand knowledge that my next door neighbor being a subsequent owner um, back in 2000 um, an in law apartment was built to specifications and regulations at the time but in 2013 that that property was sold and since then the owner rented out the accessory unit again I don't think that's a problem because it's owner occupied but since 2015, that owner moved and has a primary residence elsewhere. So now that property is being rented out as a two-family. And this is in a single-family resident neighborhood. Two unrelated parties. Neither one being, um, as I said, owner-occupied. There is a provision in this ordinance that we're considering tonight that requires the owner to occupy either the ADA, ADA unit or the primary residence. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that the city does, in fact, adopt that. Because I, I don't think it, it matters actually, you know, which unit they're there, but having the owner having a vested interest in the property, living there, taking care well, of it. The circumstance you're it. talking about, neither is occupied by the owner. In, as of right now, that is correct. And, and I also have first-hand knowledge that this um, uh, door between the two units has been eliminated. That I think that that should be enforced as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the council on this matter? No. Okay, I'm going to declare the public hearing on this closed at uh, 7.42 p.m. And note for the record that we will be taking this issue up tonight again in terms of council making a decision under unfinished business. We have no presentations tonight. Mayor's report. Two items like to cover tonight one is I have a proclamation I would like to read into the record and this has to do with uh, the recognition of National Public Works Week the proclamation reads as follows whereas public work services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens everyday lives and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings and solid waste collection. And whereas the health, safety and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skills skills of public works officials and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now therefore it be resolved that I, Edward J. Engler, Mayor of the City of Laconia, do by hereby do hereby proclaim the week of May 21, 2017 as National Public Works Week in the City of Laconia, and I call upon all citizens and organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Thank you. I'll have this for you, to you Mr. Anderson. And on behalf of the council, I will uh, okay, second that motion, so to speak, and thank uh, all of our uh, public works employees, past and present, uh, for their efforts on behalf of the city. The uh, the second thing I'd like to address tonight is the Laconia State School property. Uh, most of you have probably 
um, seen news reports dealing with that piece of property in in recent days and and uh, I'd like to update you on that and answer any questions about it if you have any uh, I think that this recent development in the New Hampshire State Senate is the most positive thing that has happened with regard to the state school since the prison closed uh, and uh, I, I view it personally uh, with great enthusiasm and uh, uh, primarily because someone in Concord, uh, namely the Senate President Chuck Morse of Salem, has has is is viewing the Laconia State School property as an economic development opportunity, not only for the city of Laconia, but also for Belknap County and indeed for the entire state of New Hampshire. And it has been, to say the least, an uphill fight to get anybody in Concord to have that point of view. In other words, Senator Morse is looking at that property as a potential economic driver not only just for our city but for the entire state moving forward and not looking at it just simply as a piece of surplus property to either be sold or used for some other administrative purpose by the state which may or may not fit the uh, unique character of the land itself and that is a is a a huge change of uh, uh, change of direction in the state so he has introduced a, a uh, an amendment to a current to an existing bill that passed the uh, Senate Finance Committee not surprisingly <coughs> since he's the president of the Senate last week and is scheduled to be approved by the Senate itself on Thursday of this week as I understand it and uh, so that will become part of the uh, that bill will then go to the house for hopeful concurrence there and the money that uh, Senator Morris put in the in the uh, fiscal see what's that fiscal 19 I guess it is budget that they're working on now to your budget uh, he included and is going to include in that state budget the Senate's version of it three hundred and sixty five thousand dollars I think to fund this initial effort so what's going to happen here and first of all you have to understand that that Senator Morris when he's when he's uh, looking at this matter is viewing it in light of the Pease Trade Port Development Authority and the tremendous success for the entire state and for that region of the state that that development authority has been. And what he'd like to do is view the state school property in that same light and have the state view it in that same light. So the first step, which was what this bill calls for, is to create a nine-member commission that will be charged with, with the, the task and given a budget to be able to do it with the task of, of determining the development potential, commercial development potential for the state school property and to hopefully morph that commission into a development authority which is exactly what happened at, at Pease after the, after the federal government decided to shut down the Air Force Base there. So commission is first step. Hopefully that will lead to second step, which will be to create a development authority. The state will still own the property, but it will be taken off the book, so to speak, on the state books and put into a separate category run by a state agency, which would be the development authority. And the, what, what we're giving up here if you want to put it in those terms, is if we bought the property, then obviously we would control its destiny, but we would also be responsible for it, everything, including cleanup, uh, demolition of current buildings, or reconstruction, redevelopment of current buildings, etc. And in this case, it will stay in the hands of the state, and for now, in the hands of this commission, this nine-member commission. Only three members of this commission will be appointed by local boards. The other six members under the law would all be appointed by state officials. The chairman and one other member appointed by the governor, um, one member appointed by the Senate, the president of the Senate, one by the Speaker of the House, I forget the others, but they're, they're uh, uh, th actually the governor and council then appoint three other members. The governor won all by himself, the governor and council appoint three members. Uh, so we would have three local the City Council of Laconia 
uh, would appoint a mayor and city council would appoint two members and the Belknap County Commission would appoint one member so those would be the three local people but importantly and again this goes to the mindset of where Senator Morse is coming from here is with the exception of the two people appointed by the Laconia City Council the way the law reads all other members of the Commission all seven members have to be either experts in the real estate development field or in the commercial business field and they can be from anywhere in the state and in fact Senator Morris is 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 very much driven by the fact that he wants this Commission to not be lakes region centric but to be state centric meaning that anyone who has expertise to offer in this area will be solicited if you will to serve on this commission uh, which is a tremendous you know in effect what he wants are business heavyweights to get involved in the redevelopment of the of the state school property which is i think a, a significant step forward and, and is going to open up the land that's in our city to a lot more expertise from people around the state who were interested in this and he's already reached out to some of the the heavy hitters in the state in the real estate development business and whatnot and asked them to become involved in this and their initial initial reaction has been very favorable uh, to that one other point I'd like to mention is that that um, uh, another very positive development here in my mind on this in terms of Senator Morse's thinking on this is he alone perhaps in Concord again understands the value and significance of the Ahern State Park property that lies immediately adjacent to the state school mm -hmm. and sees them as one not necessarily legally as one or in terms of what kind of buildings could be built on one or the other one of them is clearly a state park but in terms of the Ahern State Park which has 3,500 linear feet of frontage on Lake Winnesquam as being a a significant amenity to anyone who would choose to develop <coughs> on the state school property itself and uh, I've been pushing that point of view for <laughs> up a blind alley for several years now and it's it's good to hear someone else in Concord who who believes that uh, the value of that property is being underestimated in terms of the development of, of the whole so I think while we have had conversations of general conversations on this council over the years about the possibility of Laconia buying the state school property from the state I think at one time this council actually offered two million dollars for the property uh, a little over two million dollars five years ago or so and that was turned down I think that most of us won't try to speak for everybody have come to the slowly if nothing else to the conclusion that the regardless of how little money even if we could buy it for a dollar that we would pay for that property that the redevelopment of that cleanup and redevelopment of that property is something that's probably well outside the reach of the city of Laconia from a financial standpoint that it would cost way beyond our means uh, to be able to handle a property of that size and the cleanup issues on that property and that uh, it it uh, is we might need to become involved because of our access to so-called brownfield grants to oh, clean it up as a city and we're going to be looking into that but I think mm -hmm. in terms of ownership uh, and development rights <coughs> and whatnot it is rightfully uh, uh, a state issue and should be a state issue and the state should take the lead on this and that's exactly what this is pointing toward so the state owning the property would not be eligible for the brownfield grants because they're the polluters <coughs> in the yes right. what we don't know and what's being researched now is whether the development authority yeah would, would be, be eligible or all right not. yeah or or, how, or some other means for how we might be able to backdoor into those funds yeah. and what role the city might play in that so that's that's being investigated any questions I can answer for anybody on the council about that you just answered my question uh, where are you going to get the cleanup funds so yeah okay thank you uh, committee reports I don't think we have any tonight do we I'd like one, I'd like to see if we could set a meeting please okay um, with the government operations and ordinances to uh, for item number D to review the council rules of procedure yep 
for item B. All right, keeping in mind that we're starting at 6 o'clock on almost And we're not looking at doing this until July. I'm sorry. Or July. Yeah. July. The first meeting in July. So it would be July 10th if we could schedule it for 6 o'clock. Okay. For an hour be enough, Mary? Councilor Doyle would like to schedule a meeting for mm -hmm. the Government Operations and Ordinances Committee to take up item D, review of council rules and procedures. Six or 6.30? Six. On yeah, July please. 10 at 6 o'clock? Yes, please. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by Councilor Bear. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative, and that meeting is still scheduled for June 10th at 6 p.m. I'm going to kill July you. 10th at 6 p.m. I'm going to kill you later. Why? Any you. other committee business? We'll work. <laughs> Councilor Hamill. Um, <clears throat> would it be all right to take under um, landed buildings number C off now? Mm -hmm. The uh, Lakeport Fire Station? Or do you want to leave that on a little longer? Doesn't matter. Can I think the last on. time we proposed that, <laughs> Councillor Bullock objected to taking it off the agenda. But has it been sold? Not uh, yet. Not yet. So. All right, we'll leave it on until it gets sold. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Once we get it sold. Okay. Liaison reports. We have any liaison reports tonight? Okay, so this is a request to comment on current agenda oh, 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 items. Wait a minute. I'm I sorry. I suppose I should report. Um, we scheduled uh, a change of use for public hearing. Okay. Um, uh, without. I'm sorry? We scheduled the change of uses yeah. that the council sent back to the planning board. Oh, yes. We scheduled that for a public hearing, and that's going to happen, I believe, it's the first weekend in June, first, first meeting in June. Which so. is when? Well, the first Tuesday in June. Oh, it's going to be a Tuesday. I'm it's sorry. always a Tuesday, when they can do it. First Tuesday in June. June 6th. Okay, so this is with regard to the so-called nightclub. Program. The nightclub issue, yes. Nightclub issue. All right, so the planning board is going to take <laughs> the nightclub issue up at its first meeting, in, at its meeting in June. We took it up um, at our last meeting. And we schedule it for a public hearing. So we're going to schedule it for a public hearing and then take a vote on it. And if we send it back here, by God, we're going to have another public hearing on it. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Jose, okay, citizen comments. This is the appropriate place on the agenda for uh, people in the audience tonight to address the council on a matter that is on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone here tonight who wishes to address the council on a matter that's still coming up on tonight's agenda? I can't see. Is that Mr. Morash? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, Captain Morash from the Mount Washington Cruises. I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, come back uh, after the last meeting to uh, publicly say thank you to the board for asking the city manager and uh, public works director to come down and chat with the businesses at Weir's Beach on the parking issue. Uh, we met last week. Uh, there were four businesses that showed up. Um, Tower Hill, the Half Moon, the Mount Washington, and uh, the new Winnipesaukee Pier. We had a great discussion. You know, we had differing opinions. Um, they laid out the plan as it, as it stood. Uh, we discussed it, and it was great to be able to discuss our differences among the businesses down there at the Weirs. And I'm happy to say we did come up with an agreement that I think all of us are satisfied with, um, and it's going to be presented tonight. But I just wanted to take this opportunity, because I know you guys don't always hear the thank yous, and I wanted to be sure I got back here to do that. I appreciate the city manager and public works director for taking their time out of their busy day to come down and chat with us. Is so, the, thank you. Very good. Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah. Is the agreement you're talking about, is the agreement you're talking about the, the one I'm looking at for tonight's agenda? I believe Two it is. Two-hour parking, three-hour parking, and five-hour parking? That is correct. Okay. Good. Thank you. Everybody's in agreement? I'm going to yes. have a heart attack and die. I <laughs> know. I'm telling you. Someone will have to write a book about it's this. It's amazing what, you know, you bring us together and what we can hash out. So. Someone will have to have another public hearing day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> 
Anyone else wish to address the council on a matter that is on tonight's agenda? Okay, we're on to the city manager's report. Mr. <coughs> Myers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to echo the mayor's uh, sentiment, and I think he gave a great overview of what's happening with state school property. I also want to uh, uh, go on the record with my appreciation for Senator Morris for his efforts on this. He uh, really has a good vision and uh, is, is really taking a strong leadership role on that, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, so, so I'm going to stick with the state school property for a second before I get to um, the reports that are in your agenda this evening. I had shared with the council a couple of weeks ago about a water main break that happened on the state school property that um, was in impacting uh, water to that site. And as it stands right now, and I think I've got the details accurate, uh, represent accurately for you, but the water tank, water tower on that property was still in use. The so water was being pumped and then it was coming down and servicing the buildings. Well, right now there's only a couple of buildings that the state is operating in there and they're fairly close <coughs> to uh, Parade Road, you know, Route 106. There was some significant um, deficiencies in the water main underground that was pumping the water up to that tank. And basically the state has said that they are going to discontinue um, that operation and punch in a line and feed right off on 106 to handle the two buildings that they're operating right now. And that's all they need to do for those buildings. The detention facility up in the back, uh, it was more cost efficient for them to go in and put in a well to service that property. So that was the route they went there. That leaves Robbie Mills Field and the bathrooms up there without water at this point. Um, and I shared that with you a couple of weeks ago. So staff and I are still working through various scenarios. Uh, we are looking at a couple of thousand uh, foot length to run water from the closest point. Most of the area surrounding up there is on private wells. We're looking at options of wells possibly for irrigation and does that give us the the, uh, the flow that we need to operate, you know, sprinklers and stuff. Obviously, we think we're fine in the April, May, early June as far as not being scorching heat, but as you all know, come the heat of summer, we definitely need irrigation up there, and when the crowds are up there for the ball games, certainly much nicer to have bathrooms operating than porta potties up there. Uh, we have been in communication with the state. Uh, Mike Connor, who's with Administrative Services, even though he's retired, he's uh, back and he's connected me with someone else. Um, the state is certainly willing to work with us to try to find a solution and allow them to access the property and possibly the water tank, but um, that requires pumps and us to maintain and get a feed in from several thousand feet away. So um, it's not an inexpensive task. I don't have a definitive re uh, recommendation for you tonight, but by the end of this week, we're certainly looking at it. Um, but I'd say we're looking in the several tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, just based on the distance. And that's even for something that I would call temporary in nature, you know, running a, a temporary uh, summer line, you know, uh, dig a trench, bury it short, drain it, uh, you know, for the winter months. We're not looking to go anything fancy here, but um, it's going to be it's going to be a cost that um, easily in the tens of thousands that we're still trying to hone in on a best uh, on a best solution for you right now. Now we don't own Robbie Mills; we lease it from the state, <coughs> but we're going to be responsible for the cost of getting water to Robbie Mills. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <coughs> what about a well? We're looking at the well. Uh, we've had a well company out there and to handle the pressures that we need and the volume, they're looking at two wells potentially. Um, so that's one number that we've, we've got. I don't want to throw um, numbers around quite yet until we look at the options, but um, at least preliminary working with Seth and the water department has been very helpful in just talking about excavating a, a, a trench Mm -hmm. running at 3,000 feet, you know, temporary line, get it up, and then you need pump station, you need some electrical out there coming off of 106. That's not inexpensive. Putting two wells in and uh, getting that set up is also not inexpensive. So, um, again, the state will cooperate with us to whatever extent they can as far as if we need to access the state parcel. Um, they're not going to contribute financially. They have no reason to. Um. Another unexpected thing that we have to deal with when we're doing the budget, right? Yes. All right. Now, the other thing is the water that the state is going to be taking off of uh, 106, uh, are they paying yes. the water company? No. 
they, they paid all along. It was, it was our water that got pumped into the tank. So into they've been, the tank. They've been paying okay. for the water all the way along. They're just going with the shortest route now because they don't need that capacity for the whole parcel. The, uh, so the tank was providing pressure for Robbie Mills? Yes. So where's the line broken? Um, somewhere much further down to Parade. And, it, and the, as they were going in and trying to fix one, it was just creating a ripple effect in, and causing some challenges further up the line. The line is in very poor condition. And uh, frankly, you know, the cost they were going to put in, they don't need the line to run all the way up to the tank and then come around. They can run off a 106 with a small you know, pressure booster of some sort and get, the, uh, get the, the pressure that they need in the two buildings. Is it, is it, mm -hmm. is it possible to drill a well by the tank? and, and uh, bring it up into the tank and then run it over to Rob Robbie Mills? Those are the things you have to look at a well and then a pump. Do you need electricity there to the tank? Bring it over and then long term, as the mayor pointed out, if the property is being redeveloped, that might be a temporary um, fix going forward. So we're, we're looking at a number of things. Uh, we hopefully by the end of this week will have the, uh, the most cost effective and the best approach for us short term and long term. So the only city water goes up Parade Road doesn't go uh, Eastman or any anywhere in that area. Correct. There's nothing up Merritt Center. No. So. So I'm going to ask a silly question. I, I assume somebody's looked at the lease with um, the state to make sure that they're not on the hook in even the small way. They are not on the hook. Okay. Why? <laughs> We're lucky we have it. So I'll move on to the reports that are in your agenda packet. Uh, so on the top of page 29, we start with the new construction year tied in with the assessing year with state law. So April 1st begins the brand new year. Um, construction value at 4.6 million. Uh, both fire and rescue on page 29 and police on page 30 continue to be very busy with call volumes. Uh, we're winding down the year on motor vehicle registration on the bottom of page 30. We're through April, so we're 10 months of the way through the year. In order to be on target, we should be at around 83 and a third percent, so we're running at 87 and a third percent. So we're running uh, strong on motor vehicles. Our property tax uh, collection looks good. Uh, the impact fees are trickling in in small amounts. You have the balances there on the bottom of page 32. And the final, I promise, winter maintenance report of the final events that we had, uh, a revision for the March 31st, April 1st, and then an actual event on April 4th. So those are the final. We have exceeded our snow budget. I've been working with our Public Works Director, Wes Anderson, on, on the total Public Works budget, um, make a determination if we need to come to with a request to the Council, uh, possibly to transfer some funds out of the winter maintenance uh, reserve account that we established a few years back that we've never had to touch. But as you all know, the volume of uh, events that we had this year, we may be coming to you with a request, uh, certainly not of, for the entire amount, but possibly a portion. We're going to see how things shake out between now um, and when we get into June with the overall budget besides just the winter maintenance. Scott, uh, could you uh, go over the uh, additional fire grievance uh, that's listed here now? Yes, yeah, so that's... Um, it's more of a tracking issue, and we've sat down and talked with the unions. Uh, the grievance basically is saying they don't think they're being properly credited for the vacation hours and the, uh, the sick hours that they earn according to contract. And there's a formula in place, and sometimes it's in hours and sometimes it's in days. So the long and short of it is... Uh, back in 2005, the schedule for the fire department changed from where they were operating what were known as 13s and 11s, so a 13-hour day and an 11-hour day, but the shifts all happened in one, in one pay period, if you will. So everybody was working 48 hours in a week. There would be four shifts, two 11s, two 13s, add that together, it was 48 hours. So you were earning time based on 48 hours a week. And when you <coughs> requested a day off, a day was 12 hours. When you put in for a day off, 12 hours were, was being removed from your vacation bank or your sick bank or whatever category it was. <coughs> when we went to the new schedule in 2005, it basically is called 24s. Um, and it means that you're working back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts. You got 24 hours on. Again, there's still 12-hour shifts. 
but the way the calendar works now is you have 24 hours on, then you have 48 hours off. So in essence, one day on, two days off, then one day on and four days off. And what happens when you actually plot it out on a monthly calendar is that rotation has you working three weeks of 48 hours a week, the way the days fall in the pay period on that schedule. And you have one week where you're only working in the pay period 24 hours. So when you average 348 and 124 and divide it by the four weeks, it comes out to 42 hours a week. So the new work week now is 42, and that's what they're getting paid on instead of 48. When you divide that into four shifts, because you, you average out the calendar over the course of the year, um, and I, I should back up. So the reason we pay 42 consistently is so that someone's not getting big paychecks and overtime in one week and then small paycheck every fourth week. It just keeps it consistent and everybody's made whole. Nobody, nobody makes out better or worse on it. But now when you're working 42 hours divided by four shifts, the shifts are no longer 12 hours. They're 10 and a half hours. So therefore, the amount of hours that you earn based on working a 48-hour week versus a 42-hour week, your days are different. So even though you may be able to earn you know, two weeks of vacation, and we break that down into hours, two weeks in vacation pre-2005 was 48 hours. I'm sorry, 48 hours times two was 96 hours. Two weeks of vacation now is 42 hours times two, 84 hours. So it's really in the conversion that they're questioning, um, and we're working through it, and I think we're on very solid footing, and we just need to sit back with the union and go through it again. They're just questioning because on one thing in the contract, it says you shall earn X number of hours a month capped at so many days, and they're not quite seeing that. But on the flip side, when they take time off now, they're no longer having 12 hours removed from their vacation bank. They're having 10 and a half hours removed on the vacation bank. So they may not be earning as much, but when they're using it, not as much is coming out. So it's, it's basically a wash. We're just going through the paper trail so we can make sure that we're all on the same page. But uh, Paula Baumel does a great job of keeping yeah. notes, and she can pull out things from 2005, well before my time here, tell you who was in the meeting, what was discussed, her handwritten stuff. She is... Uh, we have to clone that. She's way. a dynamite. Well, Donna's already told her that she can't retire ever. <laughs> <They're right. laughs> so we're working through it. We just had a good conversation. Both sides said, hey, we need a couple of weeks to kind of dig through, and that's what we're doing. So we've scheduled another meeting. Uh, it's not for this week, but it's for next week to sit down and review it again. So. That was probably a longer answer than you hoped for, but no, that's uh, yeah. fine. That's that's what it was about. Thank you. Or is about. <coughs> uh, and then the second uh, report you have in your packet for the month is the uh, economic development update. Uh, again, unemployment rates are trending very strong locally and statewide. Um, on the top of page 36, you can see the CPIU, our inflation number. Inflation's ticked up in the first quarter of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see it's, uh, it ran 2.4% for March. So all three numbers for the first three months are in that 2.5% range. And um, I was actually just looking at the numbers earlier today when you go back to you know, 2014 and 15, we were around 1.5%. If you recall, last year we were at 0.1%. The budget we're working on right now allows for 1.3. So um, <coughs> this is definitely a, a little bit stronger start to inflation. Yeah. I think some of that had to do with some energy prices and the economy being a little stronger and in, in other sectors of the economy kicking in. Uh, and finally tonight, uh, I shared with the council, but I want to say publicly, we're scheduled to have a, a ribbon cutting, kind of a end of construction ceremony to celebrate the, uh, the Lakeside Avenue project at the Weirs that is open to the public. Uh, the mayor and council obviously have been invited. We're reaching out to local media, really trying to give a kickoff for the start of Memorial Day weekend uh, that the Weirs is open and a lot of great things happening there and a whole new look and um, have a celebration certainly with our partners like Busby and Eversource and, and other of our contract partners down there as well. So it is Thursday, May 25th at 2 o'clock in the Weirs, somewhere down in the area, generally in front of the Mount Washington. We haven't nailed the exact spot, but I'm sure it will be easy to locate. A long ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's what I have for you this evening. Happy to take any questions, comments you might have. Questions or comments for the manager? Councilor Hamill. I have two. Uh, is Eversource done with the LED lighting? 
We, uh, so Siemens is doing the project for us, yeah, not, uh, not yeah. uh, Eversource. We're down to punch list and, and literally a couple of ones here, and then we've got an opportunity where we'll be going through and doing the verification, doing some nighttime driving and that type of stuff. So I, I know we're not 100%, but we're 99-point-something. Sounds good. And, and again, everything was tracked from on a spreadsheet from when the lights were installed. It was all done in a daily tabulation. So part of what Siemens is doing is going back and working with Eversource. So we will get credit from the day the first light was installed. We'll get that credit. They'll work through that up at the end of the project as well. Sounds good. Uh, the next thing uh, <coughs> is going to involve the whole council, but uh, we have on our uh, meeting list of the budget. We have the school listed for the 22nd of May. Yes, of May. Um, I, I'd like to have see the council if they approve uh, reschedule that for the end of June. Um, the state is in, still in the process of going through their budgets, and it could be additional sources of revenue uh, for the school at that once that budget is passed. So I'd like to have us wait uh, till the end of June uh, on the school budget presentation in looking at the calendar just to give you options if you'd like maybe June 19th that's a night of a special meeting where we typically do the larger departments but a component of that is um, <coughs> is the city hall offices so finance welfare administration um, records you know clerk elections are in there so fire and public work right but I, so I, I think we could do because there's no regular meeting that night that's just strictly a budget oh, night okay so if we wanted okay. to flip out from administration records finance and welfare we could move that to the 22nd uh, I think with no problem and then we could uh, put the schools in with fire and public works on June 19th does that meet your that's fine. Performance. All right. So, Councilor Hamill would okay like to, if you have the schedule in front of you or can recall it, um, we were scheduled to take up the school budget on uh, before our regular meeting at 6 o'clock on May 22nd. And instead, what the manager is suggesting is that we could move administration, records, finance, and welfare to that date at 6 o'clock and move the school budget back to the June 19th so that on the night of June 19th where we would have no deadline in front of us because we would start at 6 with no meeting following at 7, we would take up fire, public works, and school. Is that my, yep. did I say that Would correctly? the state budget be passed by then? I don't know if it'd be fully passed, but I think the Senate needs to have their work done by the end of May, and since the House didn't pass a budget, I don't know. I mean, they got to go to committee of conference and get them to agree, but I don't think the House has a whole lot to stand on at this point where they didn't pass a budget. And it appears that um, the governor and the Senate seem to be somewhat in lockstep. So I would think we would have a good sense of what might be happening by that point. I, I can't guarantee they'll have it passed, but okay. I think we'll have a good sense. Any member of council object to that switch? Oh. I'm looking. <clears throat> So June 19th would be the school. All right. We have a consensus then to schedule administration, records, finance, and welfare for 6 p.m. on the 22nd of May. And on the 19th of June, we'll take up schools, fire, and public works at 6 o'clock. Go through the list again on what we're doing on the 22nd. I'm sorry? Go through the list again on what we're doing on the set 22nd. Administration, records, finance, welfare. Okay. Ten minutes stops. Yeah. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else for the manager? No. All right. We're on to uh, new business. I won't be here either, Mayor. First couple, three items here on new business <coughs> are items that would normally appear on consent and action, so I'm assuming these are new. That's why they're back in their new business tonight, things we have not discussed before. The first is a request from Lakes Region Vineyard Church Love 146 Volunteer Team to raise funds on city property on July 8th and July 15, 2017 for the Love 146 5K Run and Walk. And that is, they're asking for Opeachy Park the WOW Trail and intersecting streets on those two dates. 
both Saturdays, 10 a.m. Any discussion of this before we get to motions? All right, a motion to be in order to approve the request by the Lakes Region Vineyard Church Love 146 volunteer team to raise funds at Opeachy Park and on the Wild Trail on July 8th and July 15th, 2017, as requested. Someone care to make that motion? So moved. Moved by Councilor Bullock. Oh, Bullock. Sorry, Bounds. What that Bees ride. are tough. I'm going to let that ride. Right. Seconded by Councilor Doyle. Any discussion? Um, Councilor Bear. I thought I saw somewhere where they were going to have a disc jockey and have music. Now I'm looking for it again. What's the At, but down about? below, they said that they didn't require an amplifier, so I'm was wondering how they're going to have uh, music if they don't need an amplifier. Acoustic, apparently. I think that might be on the next one, Counselor. Yeah, I don't see it on this one. Oh, the, um, the ladies, ladies of the of lake. The lake? Yes. Okay, all right. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the Lakes Region Vineyard Church request, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative that <coughs> is approved. Okay, next up, we have a request by the Ladies of the Lake Laconia American Foundation for Suicide Prevention to raise funds at Opeachy Park on September 10, 2017 for their Out of the Darkness Walk. Any discussion of that request before we get to motions? Councilor Bear, are you? Get well, your I have the answered? same question. They um, they need electricity. They're going because they're going to have a DJ and music before and after the event, and yet <coughs> they say no to having amplified sound. So I was just you know curious because then we get into the sound. Yeah, I mean, it's the first time of uh, applications. Maybe they were confused between are you having any, um, you know, electricity? And yes, for the DJ, maybe they didn't think they're going to do anything with loudspeakers beyond that or something. But I would say if they're looking to have it a DJ, there would be that type of noise at that time in the morning. So should we should should we caution the recreation department to uh, caution them that if they're going to have amplified sound they have to get a permit for that yes I will make sure Kevin's aware of that okay motion be in order to approve the request by the ladies of the Lake Laconia American Foundation for suicide prevention to raise funds at Opeachy Park on September 10 2017 from 8:30 a.m. to 1 p.m. as requested with the provision that amplified sound would require a se separate permit Moved by Councilor Doyle, seconded by Councilor Bounds. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise a hand. Any opposed? No, no, no. I'm, I'm for. You're for. I'm okay. for. I'm just not listening to you. Sorry. You're just a little <laughs> slow on the uptake. Five votes in the affirmative. That motion carries. Actually, it was more like four and a half, but we'll call it five. <laughs> okay. Next up is Laconia Motorcycle Week Association Bike Show and Swap Meet at Opeachy Park request to waive fees. We've done that. Haven't we done this before? I think for the waiving of the fees, we just want to have the council okay. reaffirm it versus just giving approval. Any discussions fees. of this? Yes. <laughs> Charlie. Is it necessary? Yes. We don't want you to get out of your chair unnecessarily. Well, I appreciate that. You I lost do. weight. Well, thank you very much. Boy, that I'm wrong with you, baby. I'll pull my pants up a little bit on that one. Oh, you got a smile over there. Uh, we are asking for the waiver of the fees of $450. However, we are charging a fee of uh, $35. So I didn't want you to think that that was being totally waived uh, because the uh, motorcycle show lasts approximately from... Oh, probably 10 to 1 o'clock or something like that. And, we, and we're also charging our fees for any vendors that show up and approximately the same time for them. So we are charging a fee. I just didn't want you to think that we were waiving it totally. We just thought, as we have in past years, that $35 was a fair 
uh, charge for such a short amount of time. And that goes right back to the city, of course. Mm -hmm. And that is on? That was, that was <coughs> put in the information with the application. Well, I don't recall, but I imagine yeah. it was. Okay. Jennifer took care of you very well. <laughs> As, as usual, thank you. This is at Opeachy Park? That is correct. That's on Friday. What, what day of the week? On Friday, that would be uh, the 18th? 16th. Okay, I'm adding things to this motion here which are included. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, a motion will be in order to approve the request from Laconia Motorcycle Week Association for bike show and swap meet on Friday, June <coughs> 16th, and to waive vendor fees and all other fees in connection with the event. So moved. Moved by Councilor Bear, seconded by Councilor Bullock. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise a hand. Yes, Five votes in the affirmative, and that motion carries as well. Are we not going to do the discontinuance of a portion of? I'm sorry. Are we not going to do the discontinuance discontinuation of a, a portion of uh, Elm Street? That's item. That's the next item, number four. Oh, I got that as number three. So I thought you skipped over. Well, number four. Number four here. Yeah. Number four on mine. I didn't touch anything. Well, we have two different agendas. <laughs> okay. Well, on the mayor's agenda. It doesn't matter. That's fourth. As long as we get to it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Page 47 of your packet, counselors. Uh, the next item is a request to discontinue a portion of the city's right of way on Elm Street. And for that explanation, I'll recognize the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You've got a map on page 48 of your packet. Um, so this is the small paved area right in front of the fire station <coughs> building that was just not part of that parcel. Mm -hmm. um, so when Elm Street was realigned a number of years back, this just became an orphan piece that just sat out there when we were looking to go out and receive proposals for the sale of the Lakeport Fire Station. We made it very clear back in December that in order to neaten it up when we were aligning the street and doing everything else that we were <coughs> going to propose discontinuing so that that parcel could be combined with the existing lot and um, A, make it usable space um, for a new use on that site, but B, also neaten it up for the city as far as the boundary line adjustment. So this has nothing to do with um, site approval of parking and sidewalks or anything else that would happen at the planning board level when the applicant goes in with their, you know, the, with their application mm -hmm. and goes through their, their plan approval. This is just to discontinue that so that we can absorb it into the lot and ultimately have it available to sell. And we did send out certified letters to the immediate abutters as was required by law. Any questions or comments before we get to motions? Everybody know what we're doing here? Yep. Okay, a motion will be in order to approve the discontinuance of approximately 30 feet foot wide portion of the Elm Street right of way adjacent to tax map lot 367 71 25 as proposed. Councilor Boldick? Yep. Makes that motion. Councilor Bear seconds the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative, that motion carries. All right, number five on my list is Lakeside Avenue parking signage. And uh, Mr. Morash, Captain Morash addressed this a little earlier. You have in your packet <coughs> on page 53 a map of the compromise which shows three hour <coughs> parking from the train station north on the lake side of the street and five hours to the south on the lake side of the street and on the other side of the street on the on the uh, veterans property side of the street five hour parking again going down toward the beach from the train station center line and two hour parking from there up to Foster Avenue on the land side and that is a compromise and I believe in this we decided last time after we debated this for an hour that this was an administrative decision <laughs> and does not require council action right. so 
if there's Unless no Unless council, council no objects objection. tonight, this is the way the meters are going to be programmed. Sounds good. Everyone fine with that? Yep. All right. We're golden. Thank you. And, and uh, I think we all echo the sentiments expressed by Captain Morash earlier that we're, we're thankful not only for the businesses who participated in coming to that satisfactory agreement, but also to the city staff that that uh, facilitated it. Okay, item number six. And we are on to page 54. This is a request to approve a tentative agreement with the, between the city and the Laconia Professional Firefighters Association Local <coughs> number 1153 of the International Association of Firefighters AFL-CIO-CLC. Mr. Myers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the council has been briefed as to the key items, or I mean the items on this uh, tentative agreement, uh, including the cost items and other changes um, in it. And again, the council's role here is to uh, vote on the cost items of the contract as it was presented to you. And, and I will remind the uh, council by the rules of bargaining here, we are to uh, be discreet about what exactly is included in the contract until we have approved it. Right. That's so is there any questions or anything, comments before we get to motions? Councilor Hamill. Uh, <coughs> I got a, uh, one question. I'll try to make it discreet. The uh, <coughs> certain other firefighters would be getting a, a little extra. Is, is that? Uh, EMTs. <coughs> will that be um, <coughs> a contract from then on then so that it would happen every time? The differential, yes, would be part of the contract going forward, yes. So every time there's a new contract that would be in it? Typically the way it works with, with the steps to it, if you apply a cost of living adjustment or any other adjustment to that, you've created new hourly rates for the steps and that's what would continue forward. Um, in future contracts depending on what was negotiated so yes it's not one-time money so it, it would be as far as the steps but as far as the percentage would that be negotiable each contract or is that non-negotiable it could be a negotiable negotiable but realistically I think once it's there the likelihood of going in the reverse direction um, is probably not likely. It's a candid answer. I mean, anything is negotiable. You just, you know, it all depends on what you're willing to give and what you're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. It takes two sides to come to that agreement, so. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, a motion to be in order to approve the tentative agreement between the City and the Laconia Professional Firefighters Association Local 1153 of the International Association of Firefighters, AFL-CIO, CLC. Anyone care to make that motion? So moved. Councilor Bounds makes that motion. Is there a second? Councilor Doyle seconds the motion. Further discussion? All those in favor of approving the contract, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative, the motion carries. And now that council has voted on it, I'm going to ask uh, the city manager to please <coughs> brief us and the public as to what the terms of that contract are. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So similar to the SEA contract that was approved uh, a little over <coughs> a month ago, and the change that the council approved to the wage and compensation plan. Uh, this contract with the firefighters also calls for a 1% contract basically around July 1st. We'll tie it to the start of the pay, uh, the pay period, so it's, uh, it's much easier for accounting purposes. And then a 1% contract right around the January 1st date, again, tying to the first day of the pay period. So in essence, 1% uh, full year of the contract, 1% halfway through the contract, which if you net it out, about a 1.5% COLA is uh, fairly similar to uh, what the city's working with with the tax cap increase this year. Um, those employees who are entitled to steps would be getting steps on their anniversary date. Uh, there is a adjustment in the pay differential between what we pay a paramedic 
which is a higher skilled medical uh, designation, and the EMT advanced, which the remainder of our employees are. So all of our firefighters are also either paramedics or advanced EMT uh, when they're working the ambulance or even if they're going on, a, on an engine. Um, right now, the pay differential uh, for a paramedic is 5% above the EMT rate for that extra level of, uh, of skill and certification. <laughs> What we're seeing right now statewide is there is a shortage of paramedics. So in the discussions that we've had with the union and with the chief and with other departments around the state, um, all communities are doing this. So we increase the differential from its current level of 5% between those two classifications to 7%. So there's an additional 2% that a paramedic's earning that an EMT is not. Um, and part of it is the workload. Uh, all of our crews are busy, but we have a paramedic on every ambulance that's scheduled there. So um, <coughs> paramedics just by default are ending up being on more of the medical calls, and the medical calls are a, a good chunk of what we're seeing out there. And then with the opioid crisis, uh, the, the workload is really um, kicking up. So those are the cost savings, uh, so, so the cost changes to the contract. Uh, similar to the other groups I mentioned, <coughs> um, we've made adjustments for a less expensive of health insurance plan. So this one is going from a $20 copay for office visits to a $25 copay, and it would be a $50 copay if they're referred to a specialist. It also goes from a three tiered pricing on the drug program to a four tiered pricing. And again, that saves some money. So uh, we, uh, we save some money on the health insurance. And as we've done for the past three years, we would contribute $1,000 to the health reimbursement account just for deductible items on their health insurance plan that goes into a bank. It only can be used for deductible items. And if someone leaves the employee of the city, it doesn't transfer with them and, and go with them. So um, that is the, uh, the basic overview of the contract. And it's a one-year contract. We've already passed it, but does that $1,000 reimbursement, uh, do we break even on that? Do we save that much? This year, I know we did before, yeah. but we've we've had it for about three years right yeah. now, and we're seeing about a thirty percent usage rate. So, of hundred percent of our employees, only thirty percent are going uh, and hitting something that requires a deductible. So we still have that promise to pay on the books, um, but statistically, when we look at our group, almost sixty sixty five percent of either our, our individual plans, our two persons, or our families are not using any part of the deductible. So it's there. We do have a $2,000 deductible on our plan, which is a high deductible. This was a, a change that we made three years ago for all employees. Mm -hmm. And that was a way to bridge it. But I think, um, I think it's taken some of the concerns out because with the family, you could be subject to that $2,000 deductible times up to three. Mm -hmm. So potentially, if, if things went poorly health-wise for a particular family in a year, they might have $6,000 out-of-pocket deductible. So we have seen it work very well, and again, about a 30% usage. If somebody retires or somebody leaves the employee of the city, um, that money doesn't cash out and go with them in, in any shape or form. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, fine. We'll move on to the uh, last item of new business, and that is a request for the city to rent a portion of Lakeside Avenue during Motorcycle Week to the Hepatitis C Hope organization for the sum of $2,000 with the proceeds going into the city Motorcycle Week uh, fund. And uh, as I understand it, this is a, the, the Hepatitis C Hope Foundation has signed on as a I, uh, presenting sponsor for Motorcycle Week for this year and the space that's being talked about you can see on the map there on page 59 would be immediately to the north of the progressive insurance booth which has been in the street there for mm -hmm. some years and that same space last year was occupied by Amsoil Right. So this is not a new space oh, it's okay. a different sponsor in the same space less space compressed by 10 feet oh, by 30 30 feet okay so it's 30 feet less of the street than what was occupied last year the three spaces okay. right mm -hmm. and uh, some of you may be asking as I did when I first heard about this is what in the world does hepatitis C have to do with motorcycle week 
And uh, the answer is, I'm sure you're all just dying to know, is that uh, this organization has identified mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the uh, stereotypical demographic for those attending baby boomers. motorcycle week, baby male baby boomers as mm -hmm. being the uh, primary at-risk profile for people of contacting yep. hepatitis C. So you and I are looking at each other here, Councilor Hamill. <laughs> 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 uh, who who knew that we were <laughs> yeah. we were in that category? But that's Sucks. what they're that's what this foundation's interest in motorcycle yeah, week it is. It was on the news a couple of weeks oh, ago yes. that it was a serious situation. Um, so any discussion, comments, questions before we get to making motions on this request? Everybody understand what we're talking about? This is a little additional piece of revenue for our motorcycle week account. Motion be in order to grant the request for the city to rent a portion of Lakeside Avenue to the Hepatitis C Hope Foundation for $2,000 plus the permit fee with the proceeds going to the city during Laconia Motorcycle Week 2017. So Councilor Mayor <laughs> makes that motion. Is there a second? Councilor Bullock seconds the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise a hand. Five votes in the affirmative. That motion carries. And we are on to <coughs> unfinished business, according to my re my uh, agenda. Will we coincide on that, Councilor? <laughs> we do. <laughs> All right. And we have one item of unfinished business, and that is the aforementioned approval of Ordinance 2017-235-04, amending city. Code Chapter 235, Zoning Relative to Accessory Dwelling Units. And let's, uh, let's get this motion on the floor and then we can be begin discussion. So we'll start this by having someone please move to accept Ordinance 2017-235-04 as presented. So Moved by Councilor Baer. Is there a second? Okay. Councilor Doyle seconds that motion. All right, the motion's on the floor. Discussion, Councilor Hamill. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think overall, um, I think the planning board did a good job on this. But there's some good, uh, legit questions brought up tonight, uh, especially about uh, people renting out both units, and uh, you know, now it's a two-family unit instead of what it was actually supposed to be. Um, I'm just wondering if there's some kind of a change we can make to this that would make that illegal to do that. I mean, I know it's the person's house, but uh, if it's it not zoned for It is this ordinance. That, you can't huh? do that. You can't do this. Yeah, but they're doing it. Well. And it's not, it, it's not in writing, that's really. That's important. <coughs> it's not in writing. What's not in writing? Uh, uh, Dean is probably. One of the units has to be owner-occupied. Yes, it says that. It says that. This is exactly what this, this ordinance as proposed is exactly what uh, we would do in terms of preventing a duplex being created where the owner doesn't occupy it because the owner is required to occupy it um, and and show proof that they're that they're occupying the the, the you know, as a matter of enforcement yes how are we going to know when that happens and usually the answer to that is somebody who's a neighbor will I guess my we'll, uh, turn them in, so to speak. I'm sorry. You got it. I'm in. I'm in the room. I was told I had. Oh, Jesus. Okay. My question on this: We need to pass this by June first. Yes. Can we pass what we have and then tweak it later? Can we change it after we pass it? Yes. You can always okay. go back and do another amendment to. Yeah, because we have until June first to get this taken care of, which means we have one more meeting. So we've got to take care of it tonight. Yeah. Well, we really, unless we're willing to go with no regulation by the deadline, we're so late in getting this that we can't say no yeah. and have it come back to us in time to to be in effect on June one. There isn't time. That's that's, right. that's why I'm wondering if we can just go with this and then ch and then change things that need to be changed. Uh, Please suggest yeah, that's things. That's frustrating, but it's when we get it done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So we do have our planning director here tonight, Dean Trefethen. So Dean can certainly answer questions, and I think it's it's great to 
put some things out you have concerns but yes it is a requirement in the state law and again uh, Laconia is not creating this the state legislature said you need to allow these in residential zones and what they did allow was you to put some parameters so that they didn't run amok and, and take over everywhere we can limit the impact to the best we can but you can't um, you can't not allow them and you can't make things so onerous that no one would come in and put them um, in there are some according to the legislature that passed this you know the benefits were additional workforce housing opportunity of keeping family units together someone being able to stay in a, in a part of the residence and and get income from the other and that keep was some of the logic behind it but keep, keep, keeping um, people out of nursing homes yes. yeah. Yeah. so that was the the value to it but it, it is a requirement that at least one of the units needs to be owner occupied mm -hmm. and again I right. agree with the mayor that it more than likely would be brought to the city's attention by maybe some Neighbor. less than desirable activity going on in a property that had just tenants without owner occupied who may you know have a little better control on a type of thing but um, so it would it be up to code enforcement to meet out these other places that are already established well I, that's a gray area because they were already built yes. under so you can't under prior approval so right. they so don't they necessarily anything okay. new going forward would need to conform with this right. with the in-law apartments it did require back in the day you know the, the door that wasn't locked you know this one you know basically doesn't have that stipulation the door can yeah. certainly be locked somebody could add on have it as an accessory dwelling and choose to still use it under the old style of use with a with an in-law mm -hmm. and they could choose not to lock the door if they didn't want to but there's not that requirement there's no requirement that it only be used for a relative or a family member type of thing so um, this was meant to put protections in place because in theory in reality every single family residence could be able to have an accessory dwelling unit as a as a part of it now mm. I'd like to uh, bring up one thing I brought up at the last meeting that I have been enlightened on um, the uh, you might recall at the last meeting I called attention to the fact that in four residential zones uh, RR1, RR2, RS, and single-family residential, what is now permitted as a right already in this city, mm -hmm. uh, sing these accessory dwelling units, is now only going to be permitted by special exception. And I thought that was wrong on a couple of fronts, uh, not the least of which was that clearly the legislature's intent in creating this legislation was to make it easier to have dwelling units not more difficult to have accessory dwelling units and to me going from a permitted use to a special exception uh, and requiring that level of bureaucracy was an additional uh, requirement that makes it harder and more difficult for people to comply however the um, uh, planning director has informed me that by state law uh, by the state law because we are requiring conditions on what is an acceptable accessory dwelling unit by size door parking etc cetera, etc cetera, we have no choice but to require a special exception to do that if we if we simply had no specific limits on these then we wouldn't need to do that but I'm told now that it is a requirement uh, that uh, they have to go have a they have to have a special exception process in order to enforce these extra guidelines and parameters that have to be met so um, I am silenced on that issue okay. anyone else okay we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded we ready to vote all those in favor of adopting the ordinance as presented please raise a hand I have five votes in the affirmative that motion carries okay we have no nominations or elections tonight council comments council comments tonight council balance I've got a council comment which I don't normally do but I couldn't help but pay attention to 
uh, the school board and the new salaries and the tax cap and responses to that. Um, and I, I have an observation that uh, I stole from somebody else. And the observation is simply this. For at least at the time that I've been on the council, um, we have adhered to the tax caps. We've done some great stuff. We've, we're, the Colonial is on track. The Weirs is on track. Uh, the state school continues to be a juggling ball, but we're working on it. Um, but as we've considered the three budgets that I've been a part of, and this will be the fourth, only the fourth. You folks have been doing this for, some of you have been doing this for a while. Um, it, for the last two budgets at least, and I need to review my notes, but it seems to me that, and this is just food for thought, folks, um, it seems to me that what occurs is, is that fire and police and um, city departments get by with a modest increase with respect to last year's budgets. And increasingly, uh, we've been asking the school board to take a major, to take some kind of a major hit, which is hurt even more by the fact that state funding ha was radically reduced last year. I don't know what the numbers are going to be this year, and I'm glad you moved this to June so that we can get an idea of what numbers we're dealing with. But that's just food for thought. I don't want to get involved in a tax cap debate at this time. I want to avoid the tax cap. I mean, avoid doing anything with the tax cap and find a way to get a solution here that works for everybody. Because my thought is, quite frankly, our schools are, and our children are our most important asset. And if we want to get people to come here, we need to be competitive. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other council comments tonight? Okay, Councilor Bear moves we adjourn. Yes. Seconded by Councilor Bull. Yes, she says. She always does that. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you.